The most famous and popular region of France, aside from Paris, Provence and the Côte d'Azur, the French Riviera, sprawl from the Alps to the Mediterranean in the southeast. Here, native sons Paul Cézanne and Henri Matisse immortalized the local landmarks Mont Saint-Victoire and Mont Ventoux. Since the 1980s, British-born Peter Mayle has put Provence on the map even more, with his ironically loving eye on the area's beauty, characters, and cuisine in best-selling books. To see if it's all true about the south of France, Irma and Marty take off for Paris from Boston, USA. Right at the airport, a station where the high-speed TGV, the Train à Grande Vitesse, arrives to whisk the travelers 427 miles south at speeds up to 125 miles an hour in a second-class coach, comfortable enough for the three-hour ride. The tour's kickoff destination, Gateway Avignon on the peaceful Rhone River, chiefly known for its picturesque bridge, largely washed away in the 1600s, and the 14th century Palace of the Popes. At the station, some bad news from Auto Europe, a Hertz partner. The original $237 online one-week rental somehow turns into an expensively insured $121 a day rental of a homely but diesel-sipping VW Golf. Marty and Irma proceed to get badly lost for hours within the ancient walls of Avignon before locating their hotel on a typically narrow street. Message, next time, by the GPS. Then Marty has to haul the couple's two 50-pound suitcases up four flights of ancient stairs. Well, what else can you expect for 145 euros, $200 a night? At least the breakfast deck adjoining the hotel room commands a view of the palace, for 70 years the seat of one set of popes opposing a rival set of popes in Rome. Irma and Marty take in the Gothic palace, more of a fortress, and then head off for an outdoor dinner in the town square on a hot Provençal night. Next morning, a quick glimpse of the fairy tale bridge. Then the couple is off across the countryside to Pont du Gard, a spectacular 2,000 year old Roman aqueduct. From there, the Americans drive north on fast, flat roads to Orange a quiet old city once ruled in Catholic France by the Protestant monarchs of the Dutch House of Orange. The best western hotel turns out to be one of the nicest lodgings on the seven-night tour. Main site in Orange, the stupendous Gallo-Roman theater from the time of Augustus Caesar. It is France's most impressive Roman site, according to the Lonely Planet guidebook. Designed to enthrall 10,000 spectators with tragedies and comedies, the theater still puts on summer night spectaculars. Irma also likes the 1st century AD Arch of Triumph, with reliefs of Romans chaining conquered Gauls into slavery. Hey, wait a minute, today's Orangers could say. That was us. Those were our ancestors. For Irma, the first of many Salade Niçoises, a South of France favorite named for Nice. The local beer, while not bad, does not match the wine. Stick with Belgian brands. Next morning, down the road to medieval Chateau Neuf du Pape, center of one of the world's great wine-growing regions. 
White grapes as well as the more well-known reds grow here within sight of the Rhone. The fields surround a ruined chateau, once the summer residence of Avignon's popes. A long drive on back roads leads to Lille sur la Sorgue, visited less for its typical Provençal wrought iron bell tower than for its 18th century system of canals powering mossy water wheels that used to run silk factories and paper mills. Here, Marty and Irma find it hard to locate a parking place or a table for lunch. That's how crowded with tourists Lille sur la Sorgue usually is. Marty and Irma drive to Cavaillon, just long enough to drop their bags at another elevatorless hotel and start exploring Peter Mayle's part of Provence. In the scenic, grape-growing Luberon Valley, first stop is Ménerbe, Mayle's one-time hill town. Marty and Irma can easily see why Mayle found Ménerbe charming. That was before book fans swarming his farmhouse caused Mayle to move to Le Marin a few miles south. As the hill towns of the Luberon go, it's hard to beat Bagnon. In the multi-level village, known for good bread and even better views, 86 steps lead to the 12th century Church of the Height, l'Église Vieille du Haut. The simple country church is worth the climb. On the other side of the valley is Roussillon and its cliffs of ochre used by the old Romans to make pottery glazes. Today, by local ordinance, all the buildings must be painted in a shade of ochre. Famous nearby Gorda in its unrivaled hilltop setting is a handsome town where Marty unfortunately suffers his only bad dinner in France a veal dish that seemed to be veal a la Bridgestone. Even Provence doesn't bat 1,000 when it comes to food. Graceful, upscale Saint-Rémy-de-Provence, which seems to make big money from slapping unwitting tourists with parking tickets, was home to the seer Nostradamus. Vincent van Gogh, for an earful of reasons, admitted himself in 1889 to Saint-Rémy's Monastère Saint-Paul-de-Mosol mental asylum. The cloister and the lavender garden van Gogh painted are still here, and it's still a mental hospital. Van Gogh was productive here, wandering up to a mile away under supervision and completing 140 paintings and more than 150 drawings in about a year. His room with its barred windows has been reconstructed, and we can see what Van Gogh saw, though not, of course, in the unique way he saw it. Bustling Arle was another stamping ground for Vincent van Gogh. He liked Arle for its Rhone River light and its scenery. The amphitheater of Arle is reminiscent of the Colosseum in Rome, and it was close to Marty and Irma's hotel, which, again, they had a tough time locating. It always pays to stop and ask directions at the local tourist office.
with a brasserie, a cineplex, and much else. Thriving Aix-en-Provence celebrates local boy Cézanne, who loved Mont Saint-Victoire so much. Main drag is the elegant Cour Mirabeau, which boasts four fountains and plane trees that were barely saplings when Marty last visited some 30 years ago. Aix is often called the most livable city in France. The twisting streets of Old X, north of the Cour Mirabeau, are the most thronged with visitors and lead uphill to the cathedral. Old X is so old that the Hotel des Augustins once provided a room to Martin Luther. Even the city's 18th century news section, south of the Cour Mirabeau, is charming while providing a pathway to the present. At the opening of an Apple store, a white party outdoors puts local hipsters on proud display on a night of gourmet food and wines. By contrast to the modern apple party, traditions like this giant weekly street market, or marché, endure. The market caters to the area's growing Muslim population and also to Irma. From the speedy A8 auto route, Marty and Irma cut down through the mountains to Saint-Tropez so they can say they've seen the Côte d'Azur, the Blue Coast, the Riviera, from where it more or less begins. Traffic jams, no Brigitte Bardot sightings, a lunch at famed Tahiti Beach, and eastward along the base of the imposing Estorel Range, past thousands of condos and seafood restaurants toward Cannes. Wealthy Cannes, envied worldwide for the lovely sights on its beaches, for its old town climbing the hill above the port, for the luxury boutiques along the Rue d'Antibes, but especially envied for the annual Cannes International Film Festival held at the harborfront Palais des Festivals in May. The event brings movie stars, journalists, Marty covered Khan as a reporter in 1990 and 1991, and of course, filmmakers seeking deals along the busy Quasette. Top hotels like the Carlton and the Majestic are full at astronomical nightly rates. None of the usual Khan glamour sticks to Marty or Irma on this trip, though. The festival is long over and the weather is rainy and gloomy. After motorists pass through Nice, three roads lead to Monaco, the lower, middle and upper Corniche. Irma and Marty take the middle level, encountering Villefranche-sur-Mer and the picturesque Ez, before descending to the super glitzy principality of Monaco. 
a sovereign nation of 32,000 residents, including 7,600 Monegasque citizens who pay no taxes, beautifully situated Monaco has been the fiefdom of the Grimaldi family since 1297. In 1863, when Prince Charles III was ruling then the poorest country of Europe, he opened the plush casino of Monte Carlo, and the enclave's fortunes began to change. The gambling went on here all through World Wars I and II. High above Monte Carlo, on a rock called Le Rocher, stands the royal palace of the Grimaldis, built as a fortress in the 13th century. The royal flag flies to show that Prince Albert II is in residence. The royals are protected by the carabiniers, with the changing of the guard at 11.55 every morning. Le Rocher retains winding lanes where Irma downs another Salade Nissoise. Irma and Marty then stroll to the 1875 cathedral where visitors can photograph the tombstones of the late Princess Grace and Prince Rainier III. Grace died in a 1982 car wreck nearby, Rainier in 2005. Perhaps only in Monaco will you see a billboard advertising insurance for super yachts and private jet. The harbor, Port Hercules, is antenna to antenna with mega yachts, their billionaire owners registering them with the flags of tax shelters such as Malta and the Cayman Islands. Back in Nice for the final night, forget exploring the posh Hotel Negresco and the seaside Promenade des Anglais. It's raining again and time to leave the south of France with a lifetime of memories.